questions. Uh, we have Brian Lonsway, uh, who is the chair of the program. Many of you have uh, seen his name across a, a whole number of uh, different things that we've sent to you. Uh, myself, the grad program court or manager, uh, who you've received a ton of emails from, uh, including your admissions. And Vittoria Buccina, who is the assistant dean of enrollment management, or not enrollment management, uh, <laughs> at uh, the School of Architecture. Um, and uh, we're here to help you with uh, any of the questions that you may have either during the presentation uh, or afterwards. Um, but Brian is going to kick off everything uh, with a presentation about the MRC program. If you do have any questions throughout, please feel free to type them in the chat, raise your hand. We have a small manageable group here today, so I think we'll be able to um, do any video chats if you want. Uh, and we can do that at the end of the session um, as well. So without further ado, Brian. Hi, good morning, everyone. Um, uh, uh, good to see your names. Um, and, and I'd love it if you were comfortable sharing your video, um, sort of create a bit of a warmer atmosphere here for, for everyone. Understand I'm totally um, uh, shy of being on video if you couldn't believe it. And, and sometimes also am in my pajamas, um, not now. <laughs> so uh, can understand if, uh, if you want to keep your video off, but um, uh, if you uh, would mind turning it on, that would be, that'd be great. Um, also love to hear where everyone's coming from today. Um, uh, so at least if you're not doing video, just a little mic on and, and introduce yourself and say where you're from. That'd be that'd be splendid. Um, and um, we can just um, uh, go down the list. Uh, uh, Tasha, I'll, you're you're in my order of uh, of my particular Zoom grid. Hi, um, I'm Tasha. Um, I'm currently attending Savannah College of Art and Design. And yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Great, welcome, Tasha. Um, uh, Joanna. Hi, I'm currently in South Carolina, but I attend, I'm actually heading home right now. I attend OU in Norman, Oklahoma. Oh, oh great, great. Um, uh, thanks for joining us this morning. Yeah. Julia? Hi, um, I'm from Arizona, but I'm actually also currently in Savannah, um, just graduated from the Savannah College of Art and Design. Oh, oh great. Um, uh, are, are you two from SCAD familiar with each other or is it coincidence? Um, I think it's just a coincidence. Um, we've never met before. <laughs> well, uh, Tasha, meet Julia. <laughs> Julia, meet Tasha. Um, uh, thanks so much for joining us today. Um, Brian. Hello, I um, go to Kane University. So I'm up in Northern Jersey. Great, welcome. Welcome to today's event. Um, and forgive me, I'm a distance from my monitor here. Karen, if I get your name wrong. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so it's Karan, so basically pronounce it as uh, current without a T. That's yeah, so great. Okay. Hi, I'm from India. Yeah, I'm an architect. I'm working with the government of India right now. Great. Uh, thanks for, for joining us. Um, uh, appreciate you coming um, uh, today. Ian? Hi, yes. Uh, I am uh, Ian Herman. I just graduated from ESF, um, Syracuse native, and uh, attending Syracuse University. Great, Ian. Um, thanks so much for joining us from such a remote location. We uh, <laughs> appreciate you <laughs> your coming. It's uh, great great to meet you here, even though we've been neighbors for quite all attractive. this time. It's quite attractive. Yeah, yeah, great. <laughs> um, uh, Nylon. Hello, everyone. I'm a recent graduate from Mumbai, India. And yeah, it's great to be here. Look forward to the meeting. Fabulous, fabulous. Thanks so much for, for, for joining us. I think that's everyone. Um, Lauren and Victoria, can you confirm if I've missed anyone here in the various windows? Excellent, great. Um, all right, so um, uh, as, as you know, as we've, we've said, welcome. Uh, really glad you could join us today. And, and my, my goal today is to give you a sense of the program in its breadth. Uh, of course, it's a mouthful, certainly, to try to get in within um, uh, an hour. But I want to make sure to um, leave you with enough highlights so you get a sense of what we're about and all of our various perspectives. Um, and I just want to start um, with, uh, with a tour. Um, unfortunately, um, we're you know, unable to host you uh, physically here. Um, but um, but just uh, share a couple of videos uh, of, of where we are on campus, the School of Architecture. Um, uh, this is uh, Slocum Hall. 
Uh, Slocum uh, is the dedicated home to the School of Architecture. We're really fortunate to have our own building recently renovated to, um, uh, to suit um, uh, just the purposes uh, of a school uh, of architecture. Um, in the building we have, um, hey Crystal, um, she's one of our graduate student ambassadors um, who, uh, who um, uh, helped record the video and who you may have a chance, uh, an opportunity to meet um, uh, during our, uh, our various um, upcoming events. We have some events with students and, and, um, and also uh, onboarding if you um, uh, choose to enroll in Syracuse. Um, as I said, here in, in, in Slocum Hall, um, we have access to our own dedicated shop facilities. Um, we have a branch of the Syracuse University Libraries dedicated to the architecture collection. Um, all of our uh, studios, um, faculty offices, administrative services are here in the building. And we do have a couple offsite locations for various activities, um, uh, namely in recent years, um, graduate thesis as a dedicated space in an adjacent building, um, which is a pretty, pretty exciting um, uh, kind of social and workspace. Um, and um, uh, we, um, uh, we also have our own branch of the, the bookstore. So we're kind of, um, uh, you know, a, a one-stop shop, which um, is a, a great thing, of course, um, uh, for uh, being having all the resources there at your available. We're also right on main campus. And so um, uh, located uh, just at the edge of even the main uh, uh, university quad, um, about a 20 minute walk from downtown um, and, uh, and neighbors to um, an acronym you heard earlier you're from Ian ESF, which is environmental, uh, the SUNY, the State University of New York Environmental um, uh, ESF, Environmental Science and Forestry. Um, and, uh, and so that uh, has um, a really great um, adjacency because a lot of our students um, uh, enroll in courses uh, over there in areas like construction management and, and, and ecological studies, landscape architecture, et cetera. So it's a really kind of a great um, uh, connection and, and really centrally located. Um, I'm gonna switch over to my screen share and um, uh, start going through some a uh, little bit more detailed overview of the school. Everyone seeing my screen share now? Has it come up? Yes. Great. Excellent. Um, so here we are on central campus. Um, uh, we are just to the left of the W there. Um, uh, you see a building with a red roof and a little white patch on the top. That's Slocum Hall that I just uh, walked you through. Um, and, uh, and you can see here what I was saying, um, the centrality to this uh, main campus and it's you know early fall of ideal here. Um, uh, a really lovely uh, uh, campus. Um, what I uh, kind of want to frame tonight's presentation by are three major themes, um, new modes, new models, and new practices of the discipline. Um, how we kind of get to where we are and, and a, a framework that I like to use really simply to kind of communicate um, uh, what, what, uh, how I've worked with our colleagues to frame the direction of the Master of Architecture program over the last few years is you know, in, in talking to some of our um, really distinguished alum, uh, alumni here, you see Nicole Doso, um, uh, while a, an alum of our BARC program, um, really works very closely. And in, in, in fact, this year has uh, begun teaching uh, in the Master of Architecture program, uh, was um, technical director of the One World Trade Center project, a project um, of just a you know, global magnitude, you know, within the United States, incredible political resonance, um, uh, and, um, and simply its physical and material scale. Um, it was something that's been so interesting speaking with her about. Alton Chow, um, a graduate of our MARC program uh, at AECOM and responsible uh, heavily for the Shanghai Financial Center um, uh, there. Uh, these, 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 you know, global projects of a, of a scale of thinking um, that will sort of question, you know, how we even constitute our disciplinarity, um, how we, you know, in Nicole's case, in the One World Trade Center, engage the vast array of public discourses and the, the you know, the, the, the loadedness, the symbolic loadedness of a project like that here in the United States. Um, uh, or, you know, when you're designing a building that's going to, at least for a short time, be the tallest project um, uh, in the nation as the, the Shanghai um, Financial Center was, um, you know, that, that kind of perspective and that kind of understanding of, of the aspects of architecture that go beyond its material and tectonic reality um, is huge. Um, and so having conversations with people like that or on the other end of scales, um, uh, things like a recent alum from our program, Alex Colum, um, who formed Agile Lens uh, in New York City, um, God, you know, 
probably on the order of six or seven years ago, has now risen to be one of the preeminent consultants uh, nationally and globally for augmented virtual reality applications in architecture, in particular in uh, acoustic and, and theater design. Or um, uh, the, the, the kind of pool of alumni we have at, at global firms, I mentioned earlier AECOM, we have a number of students in AECOM, Gensler is another one. Um, these, these firms that are producing, um, you know, uh, uh, kind of, uh, groundbreaking research, and and if you're familiar with the work of Gensler, um, Gensler has um, uh, probably one of the well, it's a huge firm globally, but also within that firm, one of the largest um, dedicated research institutes, um, and producing um, annually a number of documents that are surveying the field and and really serve as benchmarks um, for understanding um, new you know models or ways of of thinking. So you see this kind of this new modes, new models, and new practices framework that I was talking about is one that in interactions with alumni like these and kind of understanding the landscape a little bit better um, uh, of the field, um, that story I said I would, I would frame here is one that, you know, if you look at those projects, it may be somewhere in the order of, you know, 15 or 20 years between conceptualization of a project and even the design phase, um, a detailed design phase of the project, let alone the realization. Um, Nicole um, uh, has since been working at Bernardo Realty Trust, where she went from one enormous project, the One World Trade Center project, um, to um, the use, the the, the redevelopment of um, uh, the, a famous building in New York City, the Farley Post Office, um, uh, into the new Penn Station terminal. Um, and so there, the, you know, kind of a logistic operation of relocating locating one of the busiest rail stations in the United States um, uh, is, um, uh, is a, a substantial undertaking. And so the world, when those projects are realized or certainly occupied, is a completely different world than when those projects um, uh, began conceptualization. So how do you take um, the kind of thinking uh, of architecture um, uh, historically, which has tended to be, you know, looking at exemplars from the past, framing current discourses, um, and then projecting for the forward, for the future, um, how do you take that into a world where the future is highly unknown and highly uncertain? I mean, take the last year, for example, um, and the conversations that have um, led by many of these firms that I've just shown you, um, uh, really taken the conversation in new directions about, you know, pandemic responsiveness, and, and, and assumptions we've made about you know, comfort zones and proximity and, and air circulation and, and, and all of those things that um, have been built into expected practices of the discipline. Um, and in places where it hasn't been very you know, uh, proactively considered really problematic and, and, and architecture and, and its products have actually um, uh, been obstacles to uh, more healthy uh, living. So, um, so taking these kind of questions of, of like, how do we future think? How do we ground meaningful conversations rooted in research in the past, practices that are known now, yet project forward is, is something that we take really centrally um, uh, as an aspect of our, of our program. Here you see three of the, you know, physical environments. And, and so for us, you know, these ideas of modes, models, and practices, what do we translate into the tools and techniques and environments within which we work? Um, I don't think we'd be very good spatial thinkers and architects if we didn't understand the impact of the physical environment. And so we very consciously um, uh, developed environments um, uh, that are supportive of, you know, flexible adaptation of new technology, integration of technology in the classroom. Um, and, uh, and here you see um, in the upper left, a collaborative studio uh, endeavor between our Master of Architecture and Master of Science students. Um, this was an elective visiting critic um, uh, project um, for a short um, workshop. Uh, kind of the intensity of our of our uh, collaborative efforts and, um, uh, if you will, a kind of squatting uh, of space to accommodate. On the bottom, you see uh, something more like the opposite, which is the, a dedicated studio, the Einhorn 21st Century Studio, um, co-designed by myself and another faculty in the MARC program, Kathleen Brandt, um, to um, reconceptualize um, what a design studio, a next generation design studio might be. Um, and, and, you know, what that meant for us was thinking about questions of flexibility and adaptation and, and in engagement with other disciplinary um, uh, perspectives. So, you know, what you're seeing here is a panorama of a full-scale prototyping um, uh, endeavor where we're able to really clear a big chunk of the studio for collaborative work. Um, students' desk spaces in the rear of this, so we still have dedicated workstations, but in a more contemporary model than um, uh, many kind of conventional ways of thinking about the kind of drafting table. In the upper right, you see, you know, years ago, we invested in a telepresence robot, um, able to accommodate, in this case, me, remotely um, down there in the bottom right, um, uh, joining a 
review. Um, and so, you know, I mean, robots in the classroom is on one hand, a potential convenience, right? You know, it's really handy to be remote and be able to drive around, walk around studio and talk to student work. Um, on the other hand, um, that's the kind of architecture we need to accommodate, right? We need to be thinking about, oh yeah, like the occupants of our building are no longer just people who are bodily present, but people who might be telepresent or even non-people moving through space, um, uh, other, other sentiences. Um, and so, you know, I think this stuff is kind of far-fetched, but um, if, you know, 15, 20 years ago, I told you that, you know, a vast array of the population would be walking around with talking piece of glass in their pocket that could deliver goods to them nearly instantaneously anywhere they are in the world, you'd probably think it was speaking, you know, um, uh, uh, craziness. Um, uh, to give you a little sense of the kind of culture around, I mean, these are, you know, this is a end of year exhibition of our graduate students. Um, a number of our graduate students, this is a graduate and undergraduate endeavor. Um, uh, uh, last year, won first place in the National Organization of Minority Architecture Students uh, competition. Um, uh, here you see um, DJ, Dean, and, and Kay from our graduate program um, uh, uh, proudly um, displaying their, their first place award. Um, student organization and leadership um, uh, has been a, a strong aspect of, of graduate student culture. Um, here, a Master of Science final review in that central atrium um, uh, space uh, that, uh, that I showed you earlier, um, uh, really kind of folding in these activities uh, uh, into the school. Here you see another one of these collaborative workshops um, uh, that I um, showed you before in our visiting critic studio space. Um, that same workshop um, I showed you an overhead view of um, uh, kind of engaging uh, collaborative um, uh, uh, work. And also even recently, a couple of ways that we're, we've been thinking about um, uh, adaptation. Um, this is a studio um, space, um, uh, classroom space actually, I designed um, about 12 years ago um, uh, to uh, fold in um, multiple remote visitors and a full wall video um, uh, setting. Um, the entire room is mic'd and, and speakered and multiple cameras can bring in, um, uh, can basically broadcast the entire room um, to a remote visitor. So, you know, we're not stuck behind like one camera and one view um, in the space. And this is um, uh, for this past year has been a dedicated studio to um, the incoming um, uh, graduate uh, population, um, uh, the students coming into the 110 and 98 credit curriculum. And so here you see a review. This was about a week and a half ago. Um, you know how we're kind of folding in social distancing and, and remote participation um, in the studio environment. Um, or even here, uses the use of online platforms. So this was a, a space um, uh, we designed for um, uh, meetings and classes online. Um, this is a in, an interactive uh, 3D environment, persistent 3D environment. Here you see a week and a half ago a review for the Arc 606 um, Design Futuring Studio. Um, students presenting case study work um, in that immersive environment. Um, and uh, and really, you know, sort of understanding what the affordance of these spaces may be. In this case, um, we're designing hybrid learning environments that will have an online um, synthetic component like this, um, as well as a physical component. And so what we're doing by teaching and learning and presenting in this space is as much field work as it is an alternative to Zoom, right? You know, but uh, but these tools have existed for a long time, and I think you know the the, the kind of mindset that we've embraced about next generation thinking and how we engage the world um, uh, has just made it that much easier for us to adapt to um, uh, the complexity of the past year. And so, you know, students are brought into a curriculum. I'll talk a lot about the curriculum in, in, in a bit and, and, and other of our offerings. Um, but they're also, you know, we're, you're, you're, you're coming in as graduate students to an intellectual culture of faculty research and engagement. Um, and so, you know, one of the introductions to these modes, models, and practices um, outside the classroom comes through um, a direct faculty uh, interaction. Here, just a, a sampling of our, uh, of our faculty um, and some of the research work that they're doing, um, the students have exposure to through our research assistantships and internships. Um, assistantships are, are, are an opportunity that um, uh, are made available through external funding and is really up to individual researchers um, to uh, provide, we coordinate those relationships uh, for grad students centrally through the graduate office. Um, but also um, research internships are a program that we've started. Um, uh, well, it's, it's a longstanding program, but we um, in the graduate office um, will um, sponsor uh, a alignments with faculty um, uh, in research work to kind of engage direct one-on-one -on -one, um, relationships uh, between faculty and students. Um, here you see uh, the, the virtual lab, Think Lab, um, uh, uh, and um, some of our 
uh, work with uh, recent graduate students. Um, these are two of our research interns from a couple of years ago, working on augmented reality applications for collaborative design. Um, uh, here um, you see uh, 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 Studio Aptum, um, uh, Roger Hubley and Julie Larson, um, who teach in both our Master of Architecture and Master of Science programs, a visualization of a project that they've been working with um, current graduate students for, um, boy, going on, um, I think, three or four years now um, to um, prototype and deploy um, a system for um, uh, 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 ecological regrowth. Um, so here you see a visualization of it, what the video started with, where actually the floating platforms we're about to see um, underwater here. Um, and since this time, they've been working on physically fabricating these. We had, um, uh, they received an, um, an Autodesk Build uh, Fellowship uh, last year and sponsored through that, one of our graduate students who took a year um, out of the program um, to spend uh, at Autodesk Build working with their robotic fabrication systems to uh, develop this really lightweight um, floating concrete um, uh, for, uh, for regenerative growth. And so it's those kind of projects outside the classroom that will bring you into direct um, engagement with ongoing real world applied um, uh, and speculative research um, uh, that, that, that you know, it, it's it's um, it's it's a it's an experience that's difficult to match in the classroom, right? Um, uh, the learning objectives are about um, uh, you know inventing and, and contributing to knowledge in the field, um, and so you're taking the work that you've learned in our research course sequence, in our design studios, in our other courses, um, and seeing a way that you can frame and apply that um, uh, to the world beyond. So I thought I'd kind of walk you through a little bit of our curriculum here kind of in situ. And, and I'm going to use the studio sequence um, as uh, the, the framework for doing that. Um, but I also want to say that, you know, we, we have a very integrated curriculum. Um, uh, it's a, you know, it's a, it's a compressed program um, uh, with a lot of material and just a, a, you know, a couple or a few short years. Um, and so for us, it's really um, uh, important that our research courses, our structures courses, our building technology, our history and our theory courses um, all connect into um, the endeavors that are ultimately um, often demonstrated through design and studio. Another thing I'll say about our studio sequence um, is that it's framed you know, it's it's sequential, of course, right? So, um, you know, as you repeat studios, you're gaining additional knowledge and depth of understanding. But at the same point, um, uh, the studio effort, wherever you have. So if you have an architecture degree already, you know how this works. The, there's a kind of a, 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 you know, a repetition of studio, right? So each studio takes on a different perspective and a different brief and adds additional material as you move through them. Um, but they also have um, sort of, uh, uh, you know, a, a, an attitude of repeated practice. Um, so for us, what we've done with that idea is rather than see them purely sequentially, like Studio 1 and then Studio 2 and Studio 3, um, where we just make projects more complex or something like that, um, we have thematic foci. So our ARC 604 studio, for example, which is the beginning studio that all of you who have been admitted without um, prior study in architecture would be coming into, is looking at this question of the material project of architecture. Um, questions of, of material ecology and assembly um, production here, we're looking at, um, uh, you know, structural um, principles. So taking objects that have intrinsic structural properties for another purpose, like, you know, a drinking straw or a, 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 a paper plate or a tooth flosser. Um, and, um, and then saying, so, you know, that, that was designed for a given purpose. If we understand repurposing that or using it for different questions of assembly, what are its structural applications? How does it operate? And, and you know, through that, trying to understand implications of, uh, of material assembly. Um, how, does, how does one ultimately make space that people can be, you know, enjoy being in, right? And so here you see its ultimate um, realization in a kind of uh, full-scale uh, pavilion. Um, the, so we build on those questions of material ecologies and material practices, tectonics, assembly, structure. Um, then in um, our second studio, again, for the cohort coming in without prior study in architecture, um, where we look at the social cultural project of architecture. So, you know, how does architecture affect people in different scales? You know, how, where, do we, where do we begin to understand um, the, the impact of some of those material decisions when we start looking at um, uh, sort of users and understand stakeholders? for a project that um, go beyond typical architecture client relationships. So here you see some of the work from the 605 studio where students are um, taking um, work that they have learned for human-centered design in the architectural research sequence. Um, also the application of their media skills from the media sequence. 
Um, and this is also accompanied um, by the Introduction to Architecture um, course here in the second semester. Um, uh, looking at, um, so, you know, how does one understand the world outside of architecture? How does one have conversations with stakeholders and understand the political dimensions of the decisions we make? Those students then in their second year move into the Architecture 6 Design Futuring Studio. Um, those of you admitted who have prior study in architecture um, or closely related fields um, based on your, your transcripts um, uh, have been admitted into advanced standing and are coming in uh, directly into the studio in the fall. Um, the Design and Futuring Studio builds on that. And if you're coming from outside the school and this is your first studio, builds on the expectations of, of a, of a pre-professional degree in architecture um, of a certain kind of fundamental vocabulary. Um, and then is the central studio where we look at these questions of projection, right? So here you see images um, of the studio and, and, and um, final discussions um, in the studio. This is at Einhorn 21st Century Studio. Um, uh, uh, the, of, the, of the last year, a studio taught by Professor Amber Bartosz, you see her down on the bottom left with a headset on, um, and Daquan Park, um, uh, who was um, leading a whiteboard discussion in the prior slide, um, uh, to, um, to have students um, take a real world competition framework. Um, they use the Jacques Rouge the Fondation um, uh, competition, an annual competition that's highly projective. Um, and um, in this past year, they said, you know, so what we want are entries into um, thinking about how, what agency architects have um, if we are living on the moon or if we are living deep underwater or if we're living in coastal regions where we have to deal with sea level rise. Um, and because of these frameworks, because of these sort of future thinking frameworks, um, uh, the, the, the students, you know, we're all entering and, you know, you see these um, uh, sea, space, and coast categories. Um, this is some of the student work that was submitted uh, for the competition. And, um, and we had students win um, in, you know, first prize in um, one of the categories, um, uh, uh, special mentions um, in two of the categories, and honorable mentions and placements in all three categories. Um, so, you know, the first time we entered this competition, I think this represents, um, uh, for me, uh, a clear implication of the strength of that kind of future-oriented mindset. Um, that it was very easy to kind of move into a, a competition like this um, and, and have those research and, and development frameworks um, uh, placed so highly. Uh, then students move into the Integrative Design Studio, which is the studio um, kind of most modeled on professional practice. Um, uh, this is a studio where the designs that you'll be doing in the studio are, are most realized in the form of conventional uh, building documentation and understanding. Um, yet we still build on all this kind of uh, speculative work before because we know that these projects, if we just teach you how to make you know, normative projects that will sit comfortably in the world today, you're gonna be highly unprepared for what the world is going to be even when you graduate let alone five years after you graduate or when you get licensed if you're moving into practice and uh, and so we still take some of these provocations so we look at questions uh, of sea level rise or um, uh, speculative design in terms of what might um, uh, what kind of programs or what kind of needs um, uh, the world may have at the time but ground those in conversations with structural engineers and environmental and, and um, I'm sorry um, envelope consultants and um, airflow consultants um, so that you're having meaningful on the ground conversations with other disciplines in those more speculative contexts, which is a really kind of exciting fusion. Um, students also um, will be taking um, a, a, a sampling of our visiting critic and off-campus uh, options. So um, there's one visiting critic studio that's required in Syracuse, um, where we bring in uh, some of the, you know, the, the most kind of you know, cutting edge practices to teach who aren't on our faculty, who teach um, one semester uh, in our program, a kind of dedicated uh, visiting critic studio. Students can choose from among a series of options uh, every semester that they have a VC studio. Um, and these are co-taught with upper level undergraduate students and, and master of architecture students. Um, and uh, in addition to that, um, uh, MARC students also have a required summer study. Um, and um, uh, you'll see in a little bit how that fits into the curriculum, but you have a choice. Um, uh, typically, um, we haven't run the Three Cities program um, uh, last summer. We're not gonna be running it this summer due to the pandemic, um, but, um, but we have a Three Cities Asia program. Um, here you see images from uh, 2019, um, a, a studio focused on architecture at the intersection of the, the global city and the rapidly transforming city. Um, so it has three, you know, 
putatively named cities, um, uh, but also it has many, many others. It has a travel itinerary that's quite rich. And one of its primary objectives is to introduce students to many of these practices. So here in the upper left, for example, um, you see a studio visit, that's Alton Chow standing there in the black suit and the white shirt, um, just right of center, um, and I'm Mark alum, uh, vice president of AECOM uh, Asia. And, uh, and so here's a, a studio visit um, uh, to AECOM. Um, you see, on the other hand, very small practices are visited as well in the upper right. And the studio is because it's a traveling studio, we don't have a single dedicated space, but as the students move, they move from kind of, you know, dedicated space to dedicated space. And here you see um, two on the bottom of the actual studio spaces um, uh, the students um, work in when they sit for two or three weeks at a time um, in uh, each of these major cities working on um, uh, aspects of the overall project. Um, the alternative option that you may choose in that summer is our New York City uh, studio. Um, uh, Syracuse University has a dedicated facility in, uh, in central Manhattan, um, the Fisher Center there on the right. Um, uh, this um, uh, has been uh, run consistently and even in hybrid fashion. Um, uh, and this upcoming summer will be uh, again run um, in hybrid fashion. Um, this is the, the full building that the Fisher Center is in. You see the banner down there on the bottom. It's, it's a portion of that floor that we have. Um, and, uh, and these are some inside shots of that Fisher Center. And so if the Three Cities program is looking at architecture at the interface of the globally rapidly transforming city, um, the New York City program is really looking at it through the lens of architecture's interface with real estate and capital and basically the things that allow us to do what we do uh, as a field, um, uh, certainly in, in a city like New York. Um, and so it's combined um, with our um, our new introduction of the real estate design focus or real estate development focus, sorry, uh, of our Master of Science program, uh, and um, and students um, in the New York City uh, summer program have options for internships either in architecture or in real estate development, um, uh, field studies courses, um, uh, as well as a, a studio and elective that are um, looking at questions as you saw here in 2019 of gentrification or the politics uh, of urban development. And then um, the kind of the, the, the culmination of all the work that you do is, is in our, um, our thesis course. Um, uh, the thesis at Syracuse is a unique, in the Master of Architecture program, is a somewhat unique endeavor, I feel. Um, we team teach. Um, so we have a, a, a pool of advisors that are dedicated to the Master of Architecture students. Um, and because any subset of our faculty, any, any even complete um, uh, map of our faculty to student interests would be incomplete. In other words, because you as students in our program um, would be you know, interested in, in arrays of topics that go well beyond even the expertise of our full faculty, um, we frame a common syllabus that is um, dedicated to research ethics and research obligations, um, applied research, how to develop um, informed and defensible design practices and how to demonstrate rich, complex, well-researched ideas into design using design to um, to, to leverage um, these uh, leverage these um, these ideas um, and uh, and so we do that and we require that you identify expertise from among our faculty from outside our faculty um, and it, it is very likely to be from outside of that advisor pool so what we what we we commonly share as a faculty um, is an expertise in teaching, an expertise in research application, how to engage methods and produce um, a kind of you know a defensible design uh, endeavors out of the the research work that we do. Um, and so in that thread, the thesis is a couple of of aspects. One, we want to make sure that you are producing scholarly appropriate work um, for uh, the master's level. So you're producing master's theses that are rich and well informed um, and and um, uh, you know, properly um, contextualized within the body of work that's been done before, but also take on aspects of professional engagement, right? So we are a professional degree program. Um, we don't treat our master's thesis like an academic thesis that you would find in many other disciplines, um, but it's an applied um, uh, thesis. So you are taking that research work and, and, and demonstrating its application through the agency of design, um, and thus also have responsibilities to communicate that professionally within the context of design, right? So that's that's a, a really interesting and creative challenge, right? Because you can't rely on either like professional white papers and reporting alone as a mode of output, nor can you rely on the academic paper or conference submission as a mode of output. Um, and students kind of, you know, will move through those spaces in some interesting ways, um, often resulting in either academic publication or competition entries um, uh, for their final thesis output. Here you see some of those innovative techniques of so full-scale prototyping on the right, um, structured role-playing on the left, uh, empathy building exercises, um, and also 
the application and engagement of technologies in the classroom. <clears throat> so in the upper left, again, you see another one of these large interactive projection walls, this one in the dedicated grad uh, Einhorn 21st Century Studio. Um, you see in the upper right, augmented reality applications, it's a student wearing the HoloLens. Um, and in the bottom, you know, material applications. So, you know, the, there, there's a lot to be said for the future of technology, it's engagement. Um, there's also a lot to be said for when we hit peak energy and we can't afford to turn on our power anymore, that we need to use things like, you know, manual resources and understand questions of assembly and, and engagement with the, 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 the produced world um, that may have a very different reality than one that um, uh, can rely so comfortably on, on electricity and, and the technology that it allows. So, you know, we make sure not to forget any of those conversations because we are, again, trying not to make assumptions about the next generation. So students produce, um, these are two um, uh, samples um, of student theses. Um, uh, I know video doesn't always translate perfectly well. So if the scrolling is staccato and your end, uh, my apologies. These are just meant to be kind of quick overviews of some of the thesis posters that are produced um, at the end of the semester and the kind of range uh, of work. But you can see in, 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 in both these cases that kind of represent extreme ends of a more academic or a more applied work, um, the question of design um, uh, uh, is central and design and testing through design is central. So the last piece of my presentation here uh, is to go through the curriculum a little bit um, and some of our um, uh, kind of funding and, 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 and other uh, opportunities that I know are, are questions on your mind. Um, so again, um, for all of you, for everyone admitted to our uh, program, it's 110 credit um, Master of Architecture degree program. Um, and um, based on your prior study, in some cases, prior study in professional work, um, but heavily on your, your transcripts, um, uh, we have uh, admitted you uh, into um, uh, one of um, uh, two other tracks. So um, uh, the studio sequence that I showed you uh, earlier is kind of represented with these orange bars on the left um, and the way that the studio is integrated to different bands of our curriculum um, are the core courses, the first blue box, our core courses plus professional electives, which are School of Architecture elective coursework, or in the bottom bar for the thesis, the way it really draws on a broad range of knowledge um, across all of your studies at SU. Um, Here's a simplified version of that curriculum. I, you know, um, you can get the full um, uh, sheet and examine it more carefully that I showed earlier from our website. Um, but diagrammatically speaking, again, um, you know, orange being the studios and, and blue being these different um, areas of our curriculum. Um, uh, many of you have been admitted um, into um, the 98 uh, credit curriculum. Um, what we've done here is we've waived a series of electives. Those are the courses in the far right column there and you see them um, uh, faded out a bit. Um, uh, and we've done this based on the fact that um, uh, if you've had coursework in related fields, from, um, you know, from uh, uh, some things I mentioned before, landscape architecture, construction management, industrial design, interior design, um, uh, or even if you are coming from um, comparative lit, um, uh, but have had some, uh, you know, photography classes at the upper level or, or um, design studios even, um, we see those as courses that are, you know, almost identical to courses that we would require you to take here as electives. Um, and because we have the flexibility of including various amounts of your undergraduate curriculum towards your graduate degree, um, uh, we feel that it would be, you know, I mean, no great value to require you to take additional courses of that nature. So that's what the 98 credit curriculum represents is um, uh, the full core curriculum of the um, of the full 110 credit program, but acknowledging um, uh, that um, uh, that you've taken some courses which would be very similar to courses that our curriculum might require. Um, this wouldn't prevent you from taking more than 98 credits, um, but it's a curriculum that um, you'll see in a little bit because of the credit loads in the second and third year are amenable for some other things. You'll notice that there are fewer than 13 credits in every semester semester after your first academic year. Um, if you've come from an architecture or a program that has um, uh, much more rigorous design components outside of architecture, so again, you know, here we're looking at perhaps landscape or industrial design or interior architecture, um, environmental design, um, and certainly if you're coming from pre-architecture programs, you've been admitted into our advanced setting with 76 credits. And much like I showed you before, what I've done in this image here is just kind of faded out uh, the courses um, that you've been uh, exempted from. There's a research course, there's the beginning visual literacy course, there's the first 
year of design studios, um, uh, and um, and then in the right two columns you see electives um, uh, that are waived. Um, also, we structure our building technology sequence in such a way that the beginning building technology course is really designed for those without um, uh, proficiency and in, in thinking about architectural um, uh, design. And uh, and so we also waive the beginning building systems course for those of you in this advanced planning curriculum. Um, so here you see basically that same 110 credit curriculum. It's just those those things faded. Um, what most students will do is they will pack that into two and a half years. Um, I will say it is possible to pack it into two years, two uh, full academic years with an intervening summer. Um, and, um, and while as you're looking at the beginning end of schools of architecture and thinking like, why would I want to spend more time in a program if I could get out in two years? Um, uh, I, I can tell you talking to any of our current students, if you if you would, um, uh, that basically what this accommodates are all sorts of, it, it gives you know, breathing room for the intellectual depth of a graduate program. Um, it allows you to be a teaching assistant because otherwise um, uh, we have a 13 credit uh, enrollment max for our teaching assistants. Um, so they can actually dedicate um, themselves to those positions. Um, if you want and be involved in extracurricular research or other things, having 16 graduate credits a semester is a lot. And, uh, and so, you know, in some cases, you just can't do multiple things, like I say, teaching assistantships. Um, in other cases, it's really discouraged because it's been shown to be highly unproductive, trying to do 16 grad credits and about 10 hours a week to a graduate research project um, with a faculty member. Um, and so most students end up um, uh, with this curriculum, which is um, uh, the two and a half year curriculum. Um, honestly, we've had one student who's just completing this semester, very successfully, I should, I should say, but just completing in the full two year program. Um, that student, you know, didn't partake in any of these other um, uh, things. And so we've done that on purpose. Like if those aren't of your interest and you want to kind of come in and out, pack your curriculum in two years, you can do that. Um, uh, and, um, and then I said, most students do this because some students um, will in fact still take the full three years. Um, and um, uh, to take the full three years means you're actually taking credit, graduate credit course loads that are much more equivalent to what graduate students in other disciplines take. So it gives you an opportunity to do that research step. When somebody assigns you a paper in history or theory or research class, um, you can sink your teeth into it and then actually read the citations and then go reference some of those and bring back to the conversation in class and your own uh, uh, work um, that greater contextualization of knowledge. Um, and then to conclude um, uh, where we stand with merit aids, um, uh, we are um, uh, just completing our merit aid review. Um, so all awards for your first year will be um, uh, announced shortly. Um, these include merit scholarships, fellowships, teaching assistantships, and research internships. But importantly, they don't include any need-based aid. So um, if you are um, eligible for federal, for US federal aid, um, that's something that's managed through the Graduate Financial Aid Office. Um, and if you are a student from outside the United States and you have some questions, um, our international student uh, office um, and even our graduate school um, uh, webpage, um, they have some links of contacts and also um, uh, places to look for for some, some other forms of aid. Um, uh, for continuing students, um, uh, basically all students who meet minimum GPA requirements are eligible for merit awards. Um, the award that we'll be offering you in your first year um, is um, renewable um, within certain circumstances. Again, if you maintain a, a, a full-time status and, and, and a 3.0 GPA, that award um, uh, is something that we will commit to. Um, but in addition to that, we also have teaching assistantships, um, uh, a really robust program there, um, over 30 teaching assistantships typically per term. The research internships I mentioned um, uh, that all students um, uh, may either be awarded um, upon um, uh, our uh, graduate, our merit aid review, or um, uh, you could apply to. Um, the, final the fundamental difference there is if you're awarded one, you're guaranteed a research internship for your first academic year. Um, if you don't receive one as part of your aid package, and you see there are very few, so it's a highly competitive program, um, uh, that um, you can still apply for open positions um, uh, uh, come late summer. Um, and we also have named scholarships for off-campus study. We, um, I, I think very seriously, the extreme cost of a graduate education, um, uh, and so provide a lot of support um, uh, in the studios for course materials, travel subsidies. We have um, a research and creative works program, um, a competitive um, uh, program for students. So as I said, you know, provided full-time status and 3.0 GPA, um, you may maintain your, your merit scholarships unless you move into our teaching assistantship program. Um, and in that case, depending on what your aid award may be, it may be augmented or, or, or equivalent. Um, uh, but we offer a, 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 a TA ships across our entire um, uh, curriculum. 
uh, this is across our all our BR curriculum from need from representation and visual communication to um, structures and history and theory, um, uh, including even a select few uh, design TA shifts for final year graduate students um, uh, for basically co-teaching our first year design studio um, with uh, with a course instructor. Um, uh, we also see it not just as like you know. Yep, this is a form of financial award. We're going to throw you in the classroom because we want to give you a TA ship and you applied for one, um, but rather um, a form of professional mentorship and, and, and leadership development. Um, uh, so for many of you, you may want to, you, you may not, you may see the TA ship as a, as a stepping stone to academic um, uh, uh, career futures. And so we also offer an option to participate in our future professoriate program. Um, uh, this is a university program um, with centralized support at the university level, but architecture participation allows us to, to award something called the Certificate for University Teaching and give a lot more architecture specific content. Um, so it's possible if you're a TA and you see yourself moving into an academic career path in some way, shape or form to participate in the FPP. And then if you wish, if you're in the FPP, you have an eligibility to seek the Certificate in University Teaching, which guarantees a kind of a much more specifically individually mentored teaching experience, um, as well as a review of a teaching portfolio um, and then awards you certificate, which I think will really help those of you graduating with a master's degree find a, a, a foothold um, uh, in the job marketplace for uh, academic positions over students that don't have um, that uh, kind of dedicated uh, support for, for teaching. Um, our TA ships um, uh, typically offer about 12 credits of, not about, they offer 12 credits of tuition waiver um, uh, uh, for, per year, um, plus a stipend of about 8,000 um, uh, again for the year. Um, these are 10 hour week commitments. Um, and as I mentioned, um, uh, for those of you who uh, may be in the TA program and um, uh, are really academically performing very well and, um, uh, and doing very well as a TA based on faculty and student recommendations, um, we may select you um, to be a design teaching assistantship. So these are, you know, we have maybe four or five, six, seven of these a semester, depending on the size of our undergraduate uh, curriculum. Um, and these are for two semesters and offer a full 24 credit of tuition waiver. Um, so basically full, um, uh, uh, full tuition waiver uh, and a stipend. Um, if you do the math, you'll see that because of a 13 credit enrollment max, um, uh, if you receive a TA ship for the year, um, uh, that's roughly a 50% um, uh, tuition waiver. And then I mentioned a number of other things. You can see this from our website. So if you haven't already noticed our Creative Works grant um, program, you can click here to see recent um, uh, uh, winners of the program. Um, and, uh, and I mentioned other forms of support um, for studio travel and material expenses and, and things like that as well. Um, and uh, happy to answer any questions about anything um, that I covered, but if you had any more questions about some of those programs specifically, we could address. So that does it for me in terms of my, um, my nutshell overview. Um, there's a lot of material, as I said, so um, there may be some, some questions after. I'm happy to stay until they're all answered. Um, uh, and um, again, I have just so much enjoyed um, reviewing your applications, appreciate your interest in our program, um, and would love to see you around um, Slocum Hall um, or its online representation um, <laughs> coming up in the fall. So um, that does it for me. I'll stop the screen share and then and, and we can go to um, some questions. So again, thank you. Thank you, Brian. Um, now we'll open it up to any questions that anybody might have. Um, feel free to turn on your video if you'd like uh, to ask a question, raise your hand or type it in the chat. If you want to private message any of us, you're welcome to do that as well, um, in case you don't feel comfortable raising the question to the whole group. And I do want to say thank you all for being here again. Um, I know that we've seen a couple of you at a couple of these other events, and uh, it's nice to see the same names again, um, but also nice to see the new names. Um, so if you guys do have any questions, feel free. Prajwala. Yeah, uh, hello, good evening, good morning. Uh, mm -hmm. Yes, my question was, in my admit letter, I have been received that I am eligible for uh, Master's in Architecture Advanced standing with 34 credits. So does that mean that I'm, I have been weaved off 34 credits in 110 or I'm supposed to register for 34 credits? 
Yeah, that is um, that means you have the you've been awarded 34 credits towards your degree. So that means you you have 76 credits to complete at the School of Architecture. 76 credits to complete. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. So that curriculum um, uh, that you uh, would be part of, should you choose to join Syracuse, would be the advanced standing 76 credit curriculum I talked about earlier, um, in terms of the one that can be compressed into as few as two years. But again, most students take two and a half to complete. Yeah. Thank you so much. Of course. Uh, I'm sorry, I'm not sure how to raise my hand uh, on here. Um, <laughs> I, I was curious about um, some of the programs, like you, you mentioned the FPP, the teaching assistantships, um, and, and just the array of directions you can take. And I'm curious about the um, flexibility or kind of like the, where's the hard line on those decisions to be made um in general is that communicated is that a discussion had throughout the uh, throughout the semester throughout the you know yeah yeah it's, it's a good question so so basically um uh uh, you know, first, we have about 100 students in our graduate program, Master of Science and Master of Architecture combined. Um, uh, we, um, uh, we have about 35 to 40 TA positions. So it's a, you know, it's a, it's a, it's a sizable portion of our graduate students that are serving in, in teaching assistantship positions specifically. Um, uh, generally speaking, students who are TAs, um, we don't also award research internships to. Um, there's the rare case and those students we, we speak with on an individual basis to generally take even fewer than 13 credits. So those students will often take nine or 10 credits a semester to responsibly do both. Um, uh, and, um, and so um, uh, the reason I say that is we have um, uh, students in research and teaching positions who are starting in the program. Um, we have continuing students in that. Um, and again, drawing both from Master of Science and Master of Architecture students. Um, so um, if you have been um, uh, identified as an ideal candidate for a teaching assistantship position um, for your first year, um, you've already been notified. I'm, I'm conducting interviews um, uh, for those students. To, it's a very you know, small subset of students um, uh, coming in with pre-architecture backgrounds who already have taken coursework specific um, to the, our, our teaching assistantship needs. We typically will offer and commit about um, uh, four to five of those to incoming students um, every year. Um, and again, that's based on you know, our identification of potential strengths in our curriculum, um, the results of an interview, student interest in serving in the TA position, um, and of course, students actually choosing Syracuse to study. So, um, so that's, that's one aspect of it. Um, uh, every um, October, we give an uh, introductory presentation to all students in all of our programs, first semester or otherwise, about the details of the TA program. Um, typically in November or late October, we solicit applications and every student is eligible to apply at that point. So if you're a first semester student, um, uh, when that takes place um, uh, and you aren't already serving in a TA position, um, you're able to apply. Now, what we do is we look at your academic performance in, in courses um, that um, would be appropriate for our undergraduate curriculum. So, you know, um, uh, we have a lot of students who are, um, uh, you know, who we can tell already would be ideal candidates for, for TA, but they don't have the specific, you know, disciplinary expertise to TA any of our specific courses um, uh, in, in their first semester, even in their first year. Um, and, uh, and so, um, so those, um, uh, those candidates are ones who then have, uh, you know, who would apply for TA ships once they've taken some coursework. And even that may mean during the first semester, because you're, you're taking in your first semester, for example, our Media One course, which um, would cover the same material that we cover in our undergraduate um, representation course. Um, and so we may find that that's a really good match. So in the second semester, you might be a TA for representation, right? Um, uh, so there are a number of different ways that you can move into the TA program. What, what is mostly, um, what mostly occurs um, is that um, uh, students who aren't awarded TA ships in their first year um, would take them in their second year. And seeing this kind of trend and expectation, we've also kind of um, created our curricula around that. So you'll notice um, that um, the 98 credit curricular track, for example, still fills the first year with 16 credits a semester, which is too much 
uh, for a TA position, but every semester thereafter has fewer than 13, 13 or fewer credits. So that means without shifting your curriculum around at all, you could start being a TA in the second year. Um, research internships, again, if, if those aren't awarded at the time of admission, um, uh, typically in mid to late summer, we put out um, requests. All students can apply for research internships. Um, again, the only difference is if you've been offered one as part of your admissions offer, it's a guaranteed commitment for the year. Um, if you're applying for one, um, you know, there may be somewhere on the order of you know, seven or eight positions available um, for all students to um, uh, to apply to. So it's a more competitive process, but all students are eligible to apply for those research internships. And that's really based on expertise and, and matching, right? So faculty will, uh, we will post a, 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 a list, a description of all faculty research needs, um, uh, including specific skill and, and, and research um, uh, um, requirements. Um, students see those, they apply for them. Um, and then because we're the organization that supports them, we'll work with students and faculty faculty to perform the best matches. <clears throat> Thank you. Did I answer your question, Ian? Yeah, yeah. I did have uh, one other question. Um, the, in the fall, and I know, you know, we're kind of moving target here with the COVID and, and everything. I'm curious about um, what the strategy is. Is it uh, online, in person, up to your discretion? Um, you know, in person, but vaccinated, uh, you know, that, that kind of stuff. Yes, maybe. Okay. <laughs> um, and I say that, you know, uh, obviously, we're all of this together. I mean, uh, you understand also the value of being in New York. Um, and so uh, for those outside of New York, we've had um, uh, while we're on the radar now for some problematic aspects of our state leadership, we also that that um, that same state leadership um, uh, in the broader organization has done a tremendously strong job of um, dispensing um, the vaccinations, um, uh, increasing vaccination access, and so. Um, uh, New York has been really fortunate to have that. Um, many states, because we are the United States, and sometimes not as united <laughs> as we'd like to be. Um, uh, it's a really state-by-state -state, um, uh, experience, um, and uh, and so um, so that's been a really strong thing, and and has um, allowed our senior leadership at the university um, to uh, be be pretty confident in committing um, to um, a, a predominantly in-person. Um, teaching experience in the fall. So again, everything is up for grabs. We have no idea what we're uh, coming down um, uh, to. But for example, um, uh, you know, uh, uh, you know, graduate students play a different infrastructural role at the university. Graduate students are, you know, directing and leading labs. They're responsible for maintaining lab success. The, you know, there there are research responsibilities to the federal government and organizations that grad students lead and conduct as part of research. Um, and um, as well, they're teaching. You know, so we have um, uh, so many students who are an active part of our teaching uh, staff. And um, and so the graduate students have been given generally a little bit more privilege for campus access than undergraduates, um, particularly in research collaboration. Our teaching assistants who have any kind of hybrid or in-person expectations have already been eligible for vaccination for going on a month now. Most of them are, are completing their second vaccination already. So, um, so that's a really good sign for, um, uh, for in-person. But, but as, a, as, a, as a, the kind of clearest um, in, in, you know, uh, um, the measure of this um, is that we're already scheduling fall classes and from the central registrar's office, um, we're scheduling uh, as our plan A, um, full capacity. Uh, so, you know, if a lecture hall can, you know, host 100 people, um, then that classroom is being scheduled for classes that might need 100 people. Um, uh, the departments are being um, uh, smart about developing plans B. Um, and so we do have alternative plans if we need to go online. Some of them will replicate things we did last fall. Um, but, um, but the primary motivation um, uh, is, uh, is to assume um, a relatively steady state in-person um, uh, 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 teaching in the fall. Um, but again, we're all being encouraged for, for contingency plans, but, but that's kind of where things stand at this point. Um, everything I just said is a speculation. Everything may change in a week, um, but as, uh, that's the current state of, of affairs. Thank you. I have a question. Just to make sure I understand the, uh, the scholarship process. So it sounds like freshman year, that scholarships are awarded to you um, in, the, in the financial aid package, but the latter years you apply for them. Is that correct? 
Um, no, not not uh, not quite. I mean, there's there's certainly an aspect of, of of accuracy to what you say when one looks at the overall financial package. So the first distinction I want to make is between merit-based awards that we issue from the graduate office and financial aid, which generally refers to need-based aid that is um, uh, handled through the graduate financial aid office. So what we are awarding and everything that we control funds to coming from the graduate office, um, and by we, I mean literally the three people you see in this meeting here, uh, the top row, Lauren, myself, and Victoria, um, uh, along with the dean's offices, um, are um, are responsible for merit-based awards. So those include scholarships, teaching assistantships, research internships. Um, and um, when we award those, if you're awarded a scholarship in your first year, the default assumption is that that is renewable for further years of study. So if you receive you know, an award of X in year one, um, you can do some financial planning and have that award um, uh, be part of your financial plans for year two. And if you're here for a semester, half of that award for year three, right? Um, uh, the, um, that requires that you are maintaining full-time enrollment status and it requires that you have a GPA of 3.0 for that automatic consideration. Um, a GPA of 3.0 is also required for graduation from any graduate program at Syracuse University, so that already is just kind of saying that you're making, you know, strong uh, progress towards degree completion. Um, though the one case where we may um, uh, replace um, uh, an award is if you have a scholarship in your first year and then you apply for a teaching assistantship. Your teaching assistantship tuition remission component, which is the part that we just don't bill you for tuition because you're a TA, um, uh, will replace your scholarship. So if you had a, you know, let's say a $12,000 scholarship in your first year, um, roughly the teaching assistantship um, uh, tuition remission for um, uh, for a year is about twenty thousand dollars we would we would not no longer continue your twelve thousand dollars scholarship and we would then award you that ta tuition remission which is again roughly equivalent to twenty thousand um, dollars in, in tuition um, in addition you would also be receiving a stipend for the ta ship so in that case that's where i said there was some accuracy to what you said so you know we award you a first year scholarship let's say if you received a scholarship that could be continued um, in future years um, but every student whether they're on scholarship or not um, uh, can apply for teaching assistantships um, and those would be things you apply to same with research internships those um, are something you could apply to Okay, that makes sense. Thank you. Great, absolutely. Yeah, you're welcome. Are there any other questions out there? Again, if you don't feel comfortable um, getting on camera or video, feel free to uh, type it in the chat or private message us. Um, if not, you know, I can start to wrap up here and um, say thank you to everybody for coming today. Uh, if you do have any questions or think of anything, you know, right after we signed off, because that's usually the case, um, feel free to reach out to us via email um, or give us a call. And uh, we are happy to answer anything that you might have. Um, we'll put in here a couple of email addresses uh, to make sure that you know, you have our contact information. Uh, Victoria just included the general email. Uh, and then I will put in my email address here for you. Uh, so you can send me something directly. Um, anybody have any questions before we wrap up? Hey, yeah, I had a quick question. Uh, yes. So uh, in case we get a scholarship, uh, we get uh, offered some sort of uh, you know, scholarship, uh, you will notify us via email, right? And, yes. Uh, and uh, what if in case we do not get it, then uh, like? We will be notifying everybody um, at the same time. Uh, so we hope to have the final discussions uh, on Friday with our Dean's office. And so very early next week is when we hope to have those decisions out to you. Um, and you will receive a, an email from us regardless. All right, awesome, yep. thank you. Yep, of course. Okay, so before we go, uh, Victoria has put a couple links in uh, the chat. Uh, one of them is the upcoming events. We do have a couple events coming up within the next couple days. Uh, we have a conversation with the Dean 
Uh, we also have um, uh, career services and financial aid meeting with our director of career services and our financial aid uh, representative. Um, so feel free to register for those events uh, if you have any questions specifically for them. Okay, otherwise, thank you all so much for coming and uh, we hope to see you all in August. Thank you for your time. Uh, it's absolutely our pleasure. Thanks so much for your interest in Syracuse.